ready for the last weekend message in our series, Awaken the Warrior. I pray that this has been a blessing to you. We have uh, had a phenomenal response, and, and let me just encourage you, this is not the last sermon in this series, it's the last weekend sermon. This Wednesday night, we'll be concluding this series that the Lord put on our heart. Let's just ask God to open his word to us, and then let's dive right into uh, our message today entitled, One More Nail in the Coffin. One More Nail in the coffin. Father God, thank you right now for the power of the Holy Spirit. Thank you for the joy of the Lord and the strength that is in Christ. Father, I ask you in Jesus' name that your victory will come to us, your peace will overshadow us, and Lord, that we will learn how to fight. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Everywhere I go, I'm confronted with the same things. Now, I must say that since I've begun to preach this series, it's really been less. But everywhere I go, people are angry. People are stocking up on the green beans. Come on now. People got to have that, that pile of green beans you're going to shoot somebody over. Uh-oh, I better sit down and explain that. During the middle of the Depression, many people hunkered down and said, only our family can survive. I'm thankful I've got a heritage that never, <laughs> we've never went hungry. <laughs> My grandparents said, come to the door and we'll feed you. And because they gave, God blessed them on every side. Amen. I'm the little guy in my family. Come on now. Amen. And uh, God blessed them and increased them overall. <laughs> Hallelujah. But uh, you know what? People are stocking up on ammunition and stocking up on guns. And people are talking about um, this cultural issue and that cultural issue. Let me just be real plain on a couple of things, okay? What was sin in the year zero will still be sin tomorrow. Okay? If it was a sin when you were growing up, as long as it wasn't a man-made sin, amen, it'll still be sin tomorrow. I'll never forget, in 1986, the denomination we were in held a holy convocation, and then at that, they decided some stuff they had declared sin wasn't really sin according to the Bible. Try to be a youth pastor going back and saying, hey, we can do this now. Amen. The kid said to me, how did it change? What changed? And I said, man had gotten in the way. So instead of addressing the sins the way that I wanted to, because I was angry too, and it's a bad thing to use that as a bully spot, God started dealing with my heart and said, son, you're not going to deal with the sins. You're going to preach about why people are angry. And the reason people are angry is because anger is rooted in fear. Fear will cause you to be angry because you're afraid you're going to have to go through it again. So, you, so anger is that last little explosion that hopefully you can turn them. I didn't want to have to act that way, but I just couldn't take it anymore. And you're afraid. You're afraid. But if you know how to fight and you know where to stand and you know what the outcome's going to be, you don't have to lose it because you can just stand your ground. And you can look at sort of like my parents used to say, uh, go ahead. Sure. Try it. Because I knew that when they said, mm -hmm, go ahead, try it, I knew they were going to enforce the outcome. How I many you know what I'm talking about? Amen. <laughs> that, I could go ahead and try it, but they already knew what the outcome was going to be. Some of you need to get to that place in Christ that when the enemy comes and he tells you you're going under, you can say, enemy, you can go ahead and try it, but you don't understand. My faith is not in what you said, but my faith is on the one who can call me walking across the water and can call me out through a Red Sea and can call me even if you may put me in the ground. But my Jesus is the resurrection and the life. He that is dead, though he be dead, yet if he believes, he shall live again. Amen. Woo, I feel it. Some of you are like, why? I asked them for a ball to use for an illustration. They could brought me a more girly one. I don't know. <laughs> so the Lord began to deal with my heart. It's the reason that they're angry is because they don't know how to fight. And so and I, I feel sorry for it. my poor little guy here. Every week he keeps getting moved further and further and further away. <laughs> I started to put him, right, like nail him to the floor right in front of Todd because Todd's always like, you block me every Sunday. Amen. But you know what? God told me to preach about the armor of God, and so we started a series, and I hope that's been helpful to you. God's really been changing my life through this series. 
And here's the steps, and we're going to give them to you real fast that we saw that were, that were significant here. The very first thing that God says you need to bring into your life was this belt that came on of truth. That you would wrap around yourself truth. And I always thought you had to put salvation on first, but here according to the Word, it says you've got to know the truth first because unless you see the truth, there's no hope. Unless you finally get a... Let me just ask you, how many of you have had an argument with somebody that when you finally got in the presence of that person didn't happen? I mean, you're all ready. If they say this, I'll say this. If they do this. Or how many of you have believed a lie, and when you get there, the person you've been treating bad, and you, I mean, you've, been, you've, been telling them, you've been telling them all the way there, hey, hey, you, you're going to get it when I get there. And you walk in, and they're just, that's not the case at all. Because you believed a lie. And when you believed a lie, the devil used that to destroy your mind. Now, I, I know this is going to be shocking to some of you, but what you see on the news is not always the truth. Some of you are like, really? Now, I'm on really getting some of your conservative uh, cereal this morning. What you see on Fox isn't necessarily the truth. They can be all conservative all they want to, but Hillary Clinton's one of the primary owners in it. Did you know that? Here's where I learned that what you see on the news is not the truth. I'm sitting in Port-au-Prince, Haiti, with Timon in his family's house. They, they probably were more free to travel about than we were on this day. We are sequestered into their home. The, we are told, do not go on the streets. Don't go outside because they're rioting and an American's going to get killed. It's going to happen. And so we're all huddled around the television trying to get service, looking at, at the major news network. And we're looking at this major news network, and, and we're just waiting to hear about what's happening all in the country that I'm in. And because what had caused the problem was Al Gore had flown in. And Al Gore, as he arrived, they actually tried to stone his wife Tipper to death. And so they've flown in, and here they are. And as they've flown in, and here they are, the news comes on. And all you see are cheering crowds as they welcome the wonderful Al Gore to the nation. And we're sitting down here scared for our lives. Jonas is like, we've never really had to face this. Look, we can't take you to dinner tonight. We can't go out in the streets. And on TV, it's like they rejoice at the American involvement. I'm living a lie, apparently, because I'm scared out of my mind. Or they're telling you a falsehood. I didn't mean to get stuck here, but here's the problem. Some of you are angry at the government to the point it's coming out as anger in your family. And some of what you hear is not even true. Some of the emails you get from the conservative groups are not even true. Some of the things you're hearing from the liberal sides are not even true. There are things happening that you don't understand, but here's what they don't understand. The world is lining up for the return of the Lord Jesus Christ, and it's spiraling into a place, and that they may think they're writing the checks, and they may think they're pushing the buttons, but I know who's pushing the buttons, because one day we shall see Jesus. We shall see him in victory, but until that day, my hope is not in this world. My hope is in a builder, a city whose builder and maker is the Lord. Now, I know I've preached that message already, but quickly, the next thing we saw was you had to put on the garment of holiness. In other words, if I have to, if I want to put something, let's say I wanted to put a, a stamp uh, 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 on upon my chest, I couldn't do it unless I remove these outer garments to put it there. If you have to remove your standards in Christ to do the sin you want to do, you have no business doing it. Secondly, we saw last week, what shoes do you wear? He said, wear the shoes of the gospel of peace. In other words, everything you do, everywhere you walk, ought to be somewhere that other people can follow you to Jesus. Oh, I know, I know, I know. We're supposed to be relevant. <laughs> Try walking towards Jesus and see how relevant that is, making your life better. It's relevant. Some of you wonder why I have a ball in my hands. It's holding your attention. <laughs> and so we end up at the last three pieces of the armor today. One more nail in the coffin. Matthew 16 and 18 says this. On this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not overcome it or prevail against it in the King James. Upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Now some of you... Take you back to your high school days for just a moment. What people saw as hell was a little different sometimes. Some of you, when it came time for math class, you felt like you were walking through the, the gates of the fiery pit. 
Anybody testify to that? Some of you it was English class. Some of science. But how many of you felt like you were going to hell when you saw P.E.? Very few of you. And if you were really lucky, if you were really lucky when you went into P.E., what did you find? There would be about six soft balls lined up across the middle line. How many of you know what I'm talking about? And you went, praise God, no health class today. And what were you about to play? Dodgeball, or later became known as battle ball. You were about to play dodgeball. And when you play dodgeball, there are about three strategies. See, some of you, I can see it in your eyes right now. I mean, I can see it. They are a fire. You're reliving the glory days. <laughs> Let's go. There was a guy in last service that I probably shouldn't call his name, but named Pastor David, who literally was ready to get up and run with the ball. He wanted to play dodgeball in here in the morning. But there are three strategies that are pretty much employed when you play dodgeball. Are you ready for this? Some of you are going to find yourself in these three strategies. All right, first strategy that a lot of people employed was basically when they said go, you weren't running for the ball. As a matter of fact, you were trying to find the biggest cover. You were going to go over and stand behind the second strategy, people. And then you would start dodging and weaving, dodging and weaving. All you wanted was to stay as long, uh, stay alive as long as you could. Amen. I mean, you know what I'm talking about. And you're running all over the floor. And last night while I was sharing the story, it came to me what's happening. Really what you're hoping will happen is that the people that are up front battling will be strong enough to win, and that way you win even though you don't get involved. Amen. See, that's why some of us live our faith. Oh, let, let, me, let me just get to the second strategy. I'm jumping ahead. And then you've got the people that are too mature to play dodgeball. Too mature for P.E. at all. And so they walk onto the court, and they just stand there. And the person goes, Wah! and creams them. And then they walk off because they're too mature to play dodgeball and resume taking their pen, drawing all over their skin. <laughs> too mature for dodgeball. Amen. <laughs> and then you have those people who live for dodgeball. Oh, I wish we could have got a clip from that movie. We actually have dodgeball tournaments, and you should see the way people come in here. They're ready. Like, this actually matters. <laughs> Headbands on. Too tight of T-shirts. <laughs> Just trying to show you flexing. Like, hide that nasty stuff. But anyway, let's go. <laughs> and they're ready. And what do you do? So one strategy is to bob and weave and hide behind the others and hope somebody else wins. The other strategy is just to give up from the start. And then there's the one who goes on the offense. They are so excited. How many, how, how many, let's just be honest, how many of you were that guy or that girl? Anybody? Wow. Whoa. You can use this ball after service if you want in the gym. It's okay with me, all right? Because I know I'm stirring up memories of, of your heroic days. But here's what happens. You go in, you scoop up that ball, you're dodging, you're pulling for it, you're, you're throwing that ball, and you're, there are people behind you that are just basking in your glory. Wow. And I thought as God began to give that to me, that's really the way a lot of us live our Christian life. Let's go with strategy number one. A lot of people are bobbing and weaving, bobbing and weaving, letting other people take the hits, just hoping they'll survive. Maybe the guy on the front, maybe the pastor will get such a mighty word that God can change my life. And, and if he survives, just maybe I'll win. Maybe the worship leader can, can put together such a set of music that I'll feel God and this dry and parched land will be overwhelmed with the presence of God. And maybe, maybe this team will win. And you're not engaged and you're not helping in any way. You're just trying to stay alive. Wow. Wow. Strategy two, some of you, as lame as it may be, 
you just going up there and taking the hit because you know you'll never survive. Oh, Pastor Don, what are you talking about? It's the sin that you accept because your daddy did it, your granddaddy did it, your great-granddaddy did it, and you've done it your whole life, and you just give in anyways. Why fight? We never win. And some of you, you're going for glory. And you know what? You've got to have that person that goes for glory. You've got to have that person that goes in there. But here's what God put in my heart, especially for this service. Whose glory are you going for? Because if you're fighting for yours, you might as well just go ahead and stand there and take the hit. But if you learn to walk for his, whew, the victory that can come to your life is amazing. So you say, Pastor, how can we get this kind of a, a, a advancement in our life? How can we play to win? Because you've got to understand, we're in a battlefield, and, the, and, it, and, and we walk out on it, and we show up, and we didn't even expect it, and we can either dodge and weave, or we can get involved. But how do I do that? You see, every good soldier knows that you can only stay in the trenches so long, because if you don't stay in the trench, if you stay in the trenches when everybody else moves forward, before long, you can find yourself behind the enemy lines in trouble, because the front moves forward. And many times the enemy is counterattacking from behind. And so what do you do? How do you engage? Here's one way that you can run up there and, and literally get involved and, and be a part. You can begin to live your life in such a way that you help share your faith. Oh, Pastor Don, here we go again. You want me to win somebody to Jesus. Let me just be blunt with you. Yes. I want you to win somebody to Jesus. I want people to be able, you say, well, Pastor Don, I get tongue-tied. I don't know how to tell people about Jesus. Well, it might not be the what you say. It might be what you do. It might be the decisions that you make that cause you, instead of sinning the way that you've sinned for 20 years or 30 years or your whole life, it may be the moment that you rise up and say, you know what, that's not who I am anymore. I am a new creature in Christ Jesus, and God's made a difference in me. And when they see the difference in you, it'll make them jealous for a difference in them. That's one way you advance. You actually get involved in this battle that we're all playing. Another way that you get involved in this battle that we're all playing is when you actually take time to take what God has blessed you with and show somebody else love. You see, God didn't bless you so you could be a hoarder. God blessed you. You know what? I'm sure there have been hoarders around since the beginning of time, but there's a spirit that has a control over our country right now. It's called a spirit of greed, and the spirit of greed is causing people to, to take in, take in, take in. They have to rent four buildings so they can keep, keep taking in, taking in, taking in. And you know what I'm talking about? God didn't call you to hoard up because he that wins with the most doesn't, or dies with the most doesn't win. It's he that honors God with their life and realizes they've been blessed to be a blessing that wins. That advances. Here's another way you can take a step forward. Are you ready for this? When you feel like giving up, instead you stand up. When you feel like it's all over and you feel like you're living through a barren pit of hell and there's no reason for you to lift your hands and give glory to God and you walk into God's house and people, if people had any clue what you had been through, let me tell you something. That's the kind of praise that breaks a revival loose in the church. When you walk in and everything's great and you're like, oh, hallelujah, thank you for how good things are. It's fun. But when you walk in and the devil has rode your back all the way into God's house, but yet you still stand up and you still lift your hands up to God, you are advancing the kingdom of heaven. And finally, the way that you advance the kingdom of heaven is when you refuse to surrender to sin. You know how it is. You resist, but praise God, I'm resisting. Well, there comes a time that you stop resisting and it actually becomes who you, you're not that person anymore. The person you used to be might have bellied up to that sin, but that's not who you are anymore. You see, enemy, you may have showed up, and this might be the same house, but there's a different person living here because all things have been made, made new through Christ Jesus. And he says, but you used to, you used to. It needs to come to the place that your old friends show up, and they don't even recognize you. Uh-oh. I guess I'm preaching now. Oh, that's what I'm supposed to be doing. Ephesians chapter 4, verse number 1 says, Live in a way that is worthy of the people of God, the way, what God has chosen us to, the, to be his own. We ought to live like it. Colossians 1.10, get this. It says, if you'll actually live in a way that honors God, get this, and you'll do the things that righteous people are supposed to do, you'll actually get to know him better. 
Listen to me. Saturday night was about as quiet as it's ever been last night. First service, I literally had to plead for an amen. I promise you I'll preach faster if you just say a good amen. I just need one sometimes. You can have a dry sermon or a spicy sermon. I'm going to dry it up unless your, unless your amen comes alive. Uh oh, I didn't get any amens there. Let's discuss his glorious power. I can think of an illustration from many years ago. Can I get an amen in this place? Woo, I feel it better now. Amen. The Bible says that if you actually do what Christians are supposed to do, you'll come to know the glorious power of God. And listen to what it says, so that you will know that God has made you patient and strong enough to endure anything. Some of you have been thinking everything's going to take you out. I'm telling you, begin to live for God and advance in your faith for Christ, and you'll realize this isn't going to take me out. Devil, I'm going to take you out because you've messed with a Holy Ghost-filled, anointed child of God. Amen. Oh, see, we don't understand the Scripture. The Scripture that we read says, and the, the church will hide behind its gates. Well, come on now. Even this morning, I thought about it. I was fighting the devil this morning. I was fighting the devil this morning, and I said, oh, I don't want to do that. And then it's like God said, son, what are you going to preach about? I went, oh, I better get up. Because I realized something. The scripture says the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. And for too long the church has hid behind its own little doors just praying that we don't have to fight another battle. That we don't have to fight another struggle. That doesn't make sense to me. The scripture says that we ought to count it all joy when we suffer for the cause of Christ. Why? Because what was happening, the enemy thinks he's pulling you somewhere. He's going to destroy you. But the closer he pulls you to the gates of his house, he realizes something. He doesn't have you. He is about to be in trouble. And according to that scripture that we read, the devil has to realize that he better count power behind the door because no defense the enemy has is sufficient to stop an advancing church because we have been given all authority in heaven and earth by the living son of God who has already won the battle amen Let me just make that practical for you. The devil shows up and he grabs hold of your child again. And you say, devil, I've run and I've doubted. But this time I will rise up in victory. You will not have my house. You will not have my children. We will win. The devil shows up and says, you're going to die. You're going to die. You're going to die. And you say, but what you don't understand, I died at an altar. But for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. I will march on for the cause of Christ. Amen. I'm supposed to be preaching about the armor of God, and I can't even get through the introduction. And i got four minutes left. Go ahead and tell you it ain't going to happen. What's, what's the first piece of armor? The next belt, then the holiness of God, then the shoes of God. And the next thing he says is this, take up the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench the fiery darts of the evil one. I've heard that super spiritualized my whole life. The devil's arrows are like fiery darts that pierce your soul. Well, they are. But what Paul is doing, he's describing a guy in front of him. And here's the description. They had the famous metal, metal shields that, that were rounded. They would create the great uh, moving forward that would advance against the, uh, the archers. But the standard soldier had a four-foot high, two-and-a-half-foot wide leather or fur-covered shield. And here's what would happen. They would take that shield before they went into battle, that already heavy shield, and they would dip it in the water. And when they pulled it out of the water, it would be so soaked that as they advanced and the archers lit their arrows on fire, the, that it would hit that wet fur, that wet leather, and shh, 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 it would be extinguished. And here's what 
Scripture tells us. It says, in the next piece of your armor, let your faith be like a shield with which you will be able to stop all the flaming arrows of the evil one. In other words, when you take that faith and you wet it in the water of the Holy Ghost, come on now, and you get it all stirred up and you say, you know what, my faith is one thing, but when your assurance comes behind me, because the Bible tells us that now faith, this is the American standard, now faith is the assurance of things hoped for and a conviction of things not seen. So in other words, the assurance that is used there is not a word that says, hey, okay, we assure this, but it's actually the word that means the concrete under a pillar that holds up the foundation. Are you listening to me? So in other words, your faith is the assurance, the concrete under your life that lets you know that God's in control and your conviction is the behavior in which you respond to what God has already told you he's going to do. Maybe you're not getting what I'm preaching about today, but I want you to get this. I want you to understand that in Christ, you can say, I don't know how, and I don't know where victory's coming from, but he told me not to run, and he told me to advance, and I'm going forward. I'm not giving up, and when the devil's shooting at you, faith comes over you. Whew. Every time I prayed this for years, I always put the helmet on first. Now it's time to get the helmet. We, I, I, I've learned that through this. Until you have a gospel piece on your feet, you better not put a, a heavy hat on your head because it's going to fall off. And this is what he said. He said, put on your life the helmet of salvation. Ephesians 6, 17, I love it from the New Century Version. It says, let God's saving power be like a helmet. Their helmet was this hard, face-covering hat that would deflect the broadsword the, the, the hits from Calvary that would run through the ranks might even graze an arrow off of it. I mean, it was not impenetrable, but it was, it was I, mean, I thought about how many of you knew somebody who, that your uncle or your dad or somebody fought in Vietnam, and they'd show you that helmet that had that bullet hole, and they said, praise God for that helmet, because the enemy's going to take you out where? The headshot. Now listen and tell you why he said you need to put on the helmet of salvation. Before you got saved, the devil told you you didn't need it. That's craziness. Why would you go in there and get involved in that? All they want is your money. All they want blah, 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 blah. Whew. He told somebody that today. After you get saved, let me tell you what he's going to say to you. You're not really saved. You're going to hell. Make up your mind. Do I need it or not? But listen to what the apostle says. He says, in your mind, you're going to fight a struggle. Now, would you just be honest with me? Anybody sin this week? All right, good. Because if not, you just did. <laughs> Liar. No, but anyway, it's about 21 and 8, Revelation 21 and 8. Amen. No, I'm playing. We all sin. How many of you would admit with me, you probably have sinned so many sins, you could not remember them all if you tried? Amen. But how about this? How many would admit with me there's about one or two that haunt you? Yeah. One or two sins that no matter how many times you repent over them, they keep coming back. And they keep coming back. And they keep coming back. And they haunt you. And here's what he's saying. He says, you don't think that me holding the coat for Stephen's murderers doesn't haunt me? You don't think the devil doesn't show up and say, you've traveled the world telling people about Jesus, but you killed a man? And this is what Paul was saying. If that battle that happens in your mind gets covered by the fact that you're saved. Oh, so some of you just didn't get that. Oh, I'm saved. It happens here. No, listen to me. Being saved is everywhere. And getting saved, it means that you're saved from something. And what are you saved from? The curse and the penalty of sin. You've got to get saved from that curse and penalty of sin. So the, what that means is when what you did when you were 15 or what you did when you were 25 or what you did when you were 30 or 40, what you did, all spare, what you did at 8 comes back and says, you 
are this and you are that. You're nothing but an adulterer. You're nothing but a liar. You're nothing but a thief. You're nothing but a cheat. You're nothing but this, this, and this. That what you have to say is, you're right, I was that. But what you happened to miss, enemy, was that I had one come along who saw my mind and my body that was covered with the stain of sin. And he said, hey, why don't you try this on for a little while? And he took his own clean robes off of him and his own clean hat off of him and put it on me. And when the devil shows up and says, hey, you're nothing but this, you may say, devil, you're the only one that's going to remember that because it's going to burn in hell with you. But he doesn't remember it because when he sees me, he sees somebody saved by the power of Jesus Christ. I was that, but I'm not anymore. I've been blood-bought, Holy Ghost-filled child of the King. Listen to me. Now move on to the next one. I want you to get this. Get this, get this, get this, get this. The enemy wants to constantly remind you of your past because he does not know your future. But he that's given you salvation knows your past, your present, and your future, and your future is bright in him. Now quickly, the last piece of the armor is the sword of the Spirit. When we envision this, we think about the sword, which would have been much larger than this, much broader than this, much longer than this, and we think about how the sword. But this is interesting because that sword was more effective at defending another. That sword was not effective in hand-to-hand -hand combat. And in this scripture, the word that is used is not the broad sword. It is the sharp, roughly foot-and-a-half, two-foot-long, two-edged dagger. So when he said that the word of God is like a two-edged sword. It's a two-edged dagger that would have been used in hand-to-hand -hand combat. Very close. Very similar almost, as it were, to the bayonet. They would have pulled it off, and he said this. He said, take up the shield I mean, of faith and then the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. When you're fighting for your life and the enemy has made it all the way against you and he's trying to take you out, you can be swinging that sword all you want, but it's hard to swing that sword this way. He's too close. And you've got to have a weapon. You've got to have a weapon that enables you to win when the battle's personal. Listen to what happened to Jesus. The enemy came up to Jesus. We'll just use this guy right here. And he said, because if anybody's ever had the armor on, it was the Lord, right? Amen. And he said, uh, you're hungry. If your father really loved you, he wouldn't let you go hungry. Just turn, turn these rocks into bread. You can do it. And what did Jesus do? He responded with the word. And the word was, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Now what did Satan do when Jesus responded with a word? Here's what every good, charismatic, Holy Ghost filled, Spirit filled, Pentecostal, Bible believing, Baptist, whatever you are, hears when they see that. And Jesus responded to the word and the devil goes, ah, no, no, no. That's not what happened. Read the story. Watch what he does. He counters with the word. The devil counters with the word. Hmm. You see, we teach our children to sit there with the Word when they're afraid at night. And so, look, if you know what movie this is, God bless you, you should have repented too. There was this movie in the 80s. They took holy water and put it in squirt guns. You know what I'm talking about? And the vampires, they're fighting like, ew, 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 you know, some of you literally have that mental picture that when you quote a scripture, that's what you're doing to the devil. Back devil, back devil, back devil, back devil, back, 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 back. And the devil's going, that's just water. When Jesus quoted the word, the devil did not cringe. The devil countered. Some of you going, oh, no, no, there's power in the word. Yes, there's power in the word. But the power in the word, listen, the devil knows the word better than most of us. The power in the word was what Jesus was showing 
Basically, this is the theory that he was teaching us in Scripture, is that when the devil, devil counters at you with an attack, that for every evil thought of darkness that comes into your life, you have to cap it with a thought of light. And so he says, for every bad thought the devil says you're going under, you cap it with, but you don't understand. He did not destine me for defeat. He did not make me the tail. He made me the head. He has destined me with hope and a future in Christ. What you're doing is you're countering the darkness. And when darkness comes in, you bring the light. The darkness has to succumb to the light. And that's what he's telling you to do. He's telling you to win. When you quote the scripture, it's not for the devil's benefit, it's for yours. Learn what the word says. Now listen, we've got on the armor now. We put it all on. We've got it all going. And here's where we'll close. Someone once said, the test of true character is how long it takes to quit. How long it takes you to quit. Some of you have been fighting a battle for a mighty long time. You're lonely, and you're tired, and you're hurting, and you're wounded, and you're weary, and you just don't want to push on anymore. And that's the point that you say, He's seen me give it my all. God, I've tried. When she lied, I stood strong. When he hit me, I stood strong. When they brought the dope to my house, I told them to leave. When, <coughs> when they wanted me to lie at work, I didn't do it. When they wanted me to cheat on my taxes, I didn't back him. But God, I just can't go anymore. Know you not that your battle is not against flesh and blood, that we fight against the powers of darkness and the principalities in the air. What do you do when you stand? Put on the whole armor of God. Wrap your life in truth. Put on the holy standard of God. Look, this may not be our best shout and sermon, but it'll get you somewhere. Put on the right shoes. So that the boys and girls who follow you can walk all the way to Jesus. Take up the shield of faith so you can quench the devil's attacks. Pick up the helmet of salvation so you'll know that you know the old Gaither song, I'm saved and I know that I am. And then take that sword of the Spirit. Because the word is truth. So the battle starts with truth, and it ends with truth. And then we know this, and when you have done all, stand. Some of you feel like you've pushed and you pulled and you're angry at God because God is not some push-button God. Read Hebrews 11. Read the scriptures that tell us about, by faith, how they overcame and how some went around homeless and some went around like this and some went through this trial and some went through that trial, but they never gave up. It's time for the American Jesus to die. The I want it and I want it now to die. And it's time for the King of Glory to arise to victory who says, even though they throw you in a lion's den, do not compromise because I can still shut their mouths. Though they call you to the fiery furnaces, keep standing because I'm still walking in the fire. Though they tell you it's over and you'll never see the light of day, say you can take the light of this world, but I have seen the light of the world whose name is Jesus. I will not back down. I will not go back. We will press on. We will serve God no matter what. Because quitting must no longer be an option. Stand with me if you would. When the famous explorer that came looking for the city of El Dorado arrived, the one who finally found it, something for 600 years people had fought, tried to do, and for 600 years they'd been repelled, or armies that they even found it were repelled. When the famous explorer Cortez arrived to take 
the victory at El Dorado. He turned to his men as they landed and ported their ships there upon the seashore. And he said, burn the ships. Burn the ships. And they said, how will we go home? And he said, if we go home, we will use their boats. In other words, guys, there's only one option. To survive is to win. I'm looking for some people today who will burn your rope to sin. You know what I'm talking about. That one thing you do every time you get mad at God. Let me just say amen for you. Amen. That one person you call that always leads you to sin and it's always their fault, the truth is you call them. Burn the, the bridge. Burn the sin. I'm not going back. I feel the Holy Ghost of God. I'm not going back. I'm not going back. Let me pray for you. Father, Right now, I thank you for the power of the Holy Spirit and the joy of the Lord. Some people in here are dodging and weaving, and now they need to engage. Some people in here just have given in too easily, and now they need to engage. And some have done it for their own glory, and now they need to, to engage. Father, by the power of the Holy Spirit and by the victory that comes through Christ, I pray you'll speak to hearts now. In Jesus' name. Right now, with every head bowed and every eye closed, no one looking around. There are people here, this message is speaking to you because you know you need to re-engage and you need to cut the support line. It's Jesus or nothing. Jesus or nothing. If that's you, and I literally believe there should be hands all over this building, let me see your hand if that's you. In Jesus' name. Yes, 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 yes. Now, if you would, put those down. If you're here today and you say, Pastor Don, I want to fight. The truth is, I've never even really fought. Maybe you prayed a prayer at some point, but you didn't pick up the battle. You didn't try to win for Jesus. You didn't move on for Jesus. Or maybe you've never prayed a prayer of salvation. We're not going to ask you to come from where you are, but I want to pray with you right where you're at. If that's you today and you say, Pastor Don, this day, or whatever the date is today, this is the day that I have chosen to serve God. Today, I want to give my life to Jesus. Nobody looking around and everybody praying, but if that's you, I want to pray with you. Would you just raise your hand and say, today's the day I'm going to give my life to Jesus Christ. And just hold it up high, hold it up high. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. I see those hands. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, young man. Thank you, sir. Man. Man. One hand right after another. In the balcony, thank you up there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you way back in the back. Thank you. Today I want to know Jesus as my Lord and Savior. Hallelujah. Praise God. You can put your hands down now. Hallelujah. God is so good to us. I, you know, I don't normally do this, but I just feel like maybe there's even one more. And I don't normally say just there's just one more, but normally I be very specific. I think there may even be one more young lady today that you're really struggling. And you know it's because you've never really surrendered to Christ. I'm not going to embarrass you. You know who you are. God's speaking to your heart. Would you join me now and say, I just want to make things right with Jesus. I want to know Jesus. Is there any, any young lady here that would say that today? I know God's dealing with me right now. Probably been 10, 12 people that responded, but God's speaking to your heart. I'm not going to call you out. But I just felt compelled to the Holy Spirit to call one more time. Are you here? Could I just see your hand if that's you? Just hold it up high so I can see that. Hallelujah. Thank you, hands going up. Thank you, young lady. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Nobody's going to embarrass anybody. Here's what I want you to do. Take the hand of the person next to you all across this building. Everybody here. Take the hand of the person next to you. Somebody prayed this prayer with us, and now I'm going to pray and lead you, and we're going to all pray it together. The Bible says if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart upon the Lord Jesus Christ, you will be saved. And today, that's what's about to happen. This is your new birthday in Jesus. Let's pray together. Jesus, right now, I believe your word. And in Jesus' name, I confess that I'm a sinner.
Father, you see my life. Every failure that I've ever made, I give them all to you. I don't want them anymore. Forgive me. Cleanse me. And in Jesus' name, I believe that you raised Christ from the dead. He died for me. He arose for me. And now, I am not the same. God is my Father. Heaven is my home. This matter is settled. Amen and amen. Come on, give the Lord a praise today. Hallelujah! Hallelujah! Praise God. Hallelujah. Well, listen to me. If you prayed that prayer, I want to encourage you today. What you just did in Christ will change your life for all time. We want to give you a copy of a book that's called First Steps. You can get it right out at Grand Central, or we may even have some up front here. We want you to take time, stop by and get those, teach you about how to read the Word, how to get involved in church, and the next thing Scripture says you need to do is get baptized. Because there's one thing to raise your hand and pray a prayer, but to, in order to take that full step in Christ, you need to obey what Christ has told you to do to be baptized in Jesus' name. And man, we want to encourage you in that and pray that the Lord's going to bless you and strengthen you on every